Hi, everybody. We're going to get started. I'm Vicki Colangelo. I'm the adult programmer at the Perry Civil Branch of the Stark County District Library. We've been doing virtual programming for the last nine months, and this is one of the series that we've set up. We're here today to listen to and uh, welcome author Jane Ter is it Terzillo? Terzillo. I always want to say it wrong. Um, we're really thrilled to have her here. I met um, Jane when we did a program a couple years ago with the Sisters in Crime, which was really popular. Um, Jane is a true crime author and she's been nominated twice for the Agatha for her books, Wicked Women of Ohio and Unsolved Murders and Disappearances in Northeast Ohio. Um, she's a full-time author and speaker and she concentrates on vintage true crimes and history. Um, I'm really excited to have her here tonight. She's gonna talk about some of the women in her book you can visit her at her website and read her blog. And thank you so much for coming tonight, Jane. And I'm gonna turn things over to you. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me, Vicki. And uh, thank you to the library. Um, I always have, a, have to give a shout out to the librarians and to the libraries, because if it weren't for you guys, I couldn't do what I do. That just, uh, uh, it's always the starting places, the libraries, and uh, when I get stuck, uh, it's always pick up the phone and talk to the librarian and say, yeah, I need help, and they always are able to help me, so um, I always have to thank uh, the librarians, but anyhow, uh, I am, um, uh, I'm going to um, share some stories from my book. Uh, Wicked Women of Ohio, and this book has uh, been out for just a couple of years, and I'm going to share the screen here, I think. And there's the picture. Uh, that is, um, uh, that's the cover of my uh, uh, Wicked Women of Ohio, and I've chosen, uh, I was going through the book uh, a couple of days ago, and I've chosen three stories to talk about. And uh, there is a question um, thing at the bottom of your screen. I, I don't see it on mine right now. But um, so if you have questions, uh, I guess maybe we'll hold them till the end uh, is, a, is a good idea. And then, um, and then we can all just, just talk. So I, I'm, gonna ta uh, I'm gonna tell you about these women. And uh, then when I get done, we'll uh, maybe have a little conversation. Uh, that's one of my favorite parts of, of presentations. So the first one I want to talk about was uh, uh, Maud Collins, and, and here she is. Uh, the story starts October the 8th, 1925, in Vinton County, Ohio. Uh, her husband, Fletcher, was uh, the sheriff in Vinton County, and he was murdered on that date. And she became uh, the first female sheriff. She took over his job. Now, the, one of the reasons being that she had five children and she had no other way to, uh, uh, you know, to feed them. Um, and the sheriff's house where she lived was uh, uh, adjacent to the jail. They were all one building. And um, so it was the... Uh, the counties that it was owned by the county. And if um, she wasn't the, the sheriff, she had no place to live. So she pretty much had to, uh, had, had to take the job. Um, she, but you know, she wasn't, uh, uh, she wasn't a neophyte. She had been the jail matron, uh, which meant that uh, she did, uh, uh, she did a lot of the paperwork. Of course, she probably cleaned the jail. She probably fed the prisoners. Um, and she knew the county. She knew a lot of the people in, in the county. And uh, uh, so she was, she was good that way. But she had one other, uh, one other thing about her that probably made her a, a good sheriff. And that was that her, grand, her grandfather was Randall McCoy of the uh, uh, Hatfields and McCoys. So she knew how to shoot. Uh, she had brothers and she knew how to handle them. Um, she was smart. She was, um, she was intuitive. Uh, she was clever. She was suspicious. She had a suspicious mind. 
Um, and uh, she had, of course, tracking skills. So that that made her a good uh, uh, a good good candidate for sheriff. So when she took over, she was uh, things were fairly calm for about the first year, and then in 1926, uh, the biggest case came along, and it was a double murder in Vinton County. Now, she got a phone call one night that or one day uh, that a lady named Sarah Stout had been murdered. And Sarah was the second wife of Bill Stout. Um, and Bill Stout had, uh, he was, he was a, a wealthy landowner. He owned a lot of farmland out on what they called Axtell Ridge. Um, and he had three sons. Uh, this was one of them. This is Arthur. Um, and the other two don't really figure into the story that much. But she went out to uh, to the house at Axtell Ridge and she found Sarah Stout had been uh, bashed in the back of the head. She'd been strangled. And they also, the murderer also tried to uh, burn, burn the place down. Uh, and poor Sarah had been, uh, uh, her body had been burned quite a bit. So Maude, uh, having the uh, kind of personality that she had, she kind of followed uh, uh, the clues and looked mostly into the relationships in the family. And um, she, what she first realized was that Sarah uh, and her stepson, Arthur, this guy that you're seeing on the, on the screen right here, uh, had a very young, very pretty housekeeper for himself and his uh, and his two young boys, um, and her name was Inez Palmer. Now they lived together with the two boys on the property in a uh, in a cabin, and Sarah did not approve of this. Sarah was a good, uh, you know, God fearing woman, and she did not approve of uh, living together unless uh, unless they were married. And she took a step farther with that by having Arthur, or Artie, he was sometimes called, arrested uh, by the, J uh, the Justice of the Peace. Well, that caused a lot of friction, you know. So Maud, as I said, she followed the clues. Uh, she found that there had been a, uh, a wagon at the house. Uh, and she called out the dogs. And they followed... They followed their noses and they followed it right back to uh, uh, to the cabin where uh, Arthur and Inez were living. So Arthur wound up arrested for the murder of Sarah Stout. Well, a few a few months later, uh, Inez called Maud and said that Bill Stout had disappeared. Now he was uh, he was staying with Inez and the two boys in the cabin. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not sure why that was, although maybe he didn't want to go back to the cabin where his uh, where his wife had been murdered. I'm I'm not sure. But anyhow, Bill had come up missing. So Maud and her chief deputy Ray Cox drove out to uh, Axtell Ridge and began to investigate. Inez told her that uh, Bill had gone out to the back 40, I don't think they called it that, but that's what I'm calling it, uh, to repair some fence posts. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, so Maud and, and Ray Cox went out to the back 40 and sure enough, they found his wagon, they found his tools. And it kind of looked as though he had been working on the fence posts. Um, she also found uh, his, what they called back then his dinner bucket, we call it his lunch pail. And inside it was a note or a sort of a will. And uh, the will left everything of the whole, all the land and everything to Arthur. Well, Maud's thinking that's kind of strange because he has two other boys. He has two 
uh, Arthur had two brothers and there were grandchildren to be considered. So she thought that was kind of strange. Well, the other really strange thing was that he in this note uh, confessed to killing Sarah, his wife. So Maud kind of, uh, she stuck that in her purse and um, she's looking around on the ground and she sees uh, footprints, indentations of boots, and they were long, you know, men's, but she's thinking, gee, you know, they're really not deep enough. The impressions really aren't deep enough for a man of uh, Bill Stout's size. So um, she goes and she gets, uh, uh, she goes to uh, their house and she gets some of his boots and she puts them on herself. And she walks along beside these impressions and she notices that Yes, she only sinks in just so far, not far enough to be, uh, you know, uh, what a man would, uh, a big heavy man would sink into the, uh, in, into the mud. So she knows that these are not Bill's uh, footprints. And she's also pretty darn sure that this will of sort is not uh, Bill, uh, Bill Stout's. But just to make sure, she goes into town and goes to the bank and she goes to the banker, which is where uh, Bill did his, uh, uh, his banking. And she shows the note to the banker. The banker goes to his file cabinet, pulls out some uh, paperwork that Bill Stout had made out so that they can compare the handwriting and oh no, the handwriting just doesn't match. So, She's, uh, Maud is thinking, well, okay, you know, this is, this is really strange. Um, but, you know, she said, we don't have a body. I, you know, uh, we don't know where he is or, you know, if he's dead or alive. So she and Ray Cox drive back out to talk some more to Inez. And along the way, she sees Arthur's two, two little boys and they're caught, they're, uh, carrying, um, uh, water pails. They're pails full of water. And so she stops and she said, what are you doing with the, the pails of water? Uh, she said, you, you've got your own well. And the one boy said, well, Inez says that the water isn't good in our well. So Maud gets thinking, hmm, I wonder why the weather, the, the water's not good in the well. So they go on out to, uh, to the cabin where Inez is and uh, she sends Ray Cox to look down the well while she's talking to Inez. And sure enough, Bill Stout's body is in the well. So, um, of course, both Bill, uh, both Arthur and Inez um, went to prison over that. So this was kind of a fun, uh, fun story to research. Uh, and, and I learned a lot, you know, every story is different. Uh, the research is, is different, takes you in different directions. And so I learned something different with each, you know, with each story. Well, this one, I was able to find um, Maud Collins' granddaughter. Uh, her name was Valerie. And she talked to me several hours on the phone, several times on the phone, and told me a good deal about her uh, grandmother's uh, personality and, and, uh, everything it was and it was fun to you know having pictures of her was one thing and I have more than more than just the picture that I showed you um, but then to hear about her her personality was just you know really cool um, and of course I I visited Vinton County and I have a friend that I uh, that is also a uh, history press author her name is Wendy Coyle and she and I like to do, when we can, we like to do some research together. And so both of us went to Vinton County and um, we got to talk to uh, the current president of the, of the Historical Society and the past president of the Historical Society. And the past president, wow, I mean, he was like an encyclopedia of, of uh, history of the county. It was just, you know, it was just great. So they drove us out there to Axtell Ridge. So now 
the road out there was a gravel gravel road and it probably well it wasn't wide enough for two cars to for two cars to pass it might have been like maybe a a, wide, a a car and a half wide and on the way out there we saw um uh, trailers that were had been burned out that were boarded up that had been burned out and um, they had told me that the um, the president the current president had said that the house where uh, Sarah had been murdered was still standing but the cabin was not <clears throat> so I was thinking oh wow I can get a picture of the uh, uh, of the house where Sarah was murdered. So we got to the house and, and the house was just, there was like junk all over in the yard, like, you know, cars with uh, junk cars, rusted out cars with weeds growing up through the, um, through the motor, you know, and everything. And, and there was um, kind of a, an old battered up uh, pickup truck sitting out front and there were a couple of guys in it and they were kind of tough looking birds, you know, uh, and they had, some, they had some dogs that were, you know, barking and, and everything. And so and I kind of decided I didn't want to stop to take pictures there. So we drove back on out to where the, um, where the cabin had been and um, the, um, the well is still there. Um, and you can see here, uh, where the well, where the well was. And it was, uh, let's see, we were, I think we were up here. We were up here looking down and uh, saw where the well it had been capped off, but it was still there, but all these buildings were, were all gone. So um, in my research, I kept running across uh, that there was an article that had been in a, uh, at first, they said it was a true crime magazine, and I later found out it was actually called Master Detective. So I went to the library, of course, and tried to find it. And the library said, well, we don't have it, but so-and-so has it. And she named three libraries, and I called all three libraries, and none of them had it. And they would all give me the name of another library, and I'd call there, and no, they didn't have it. And, and so finally, I thought, I want this darn article because it was written at the time that Maud was alive and there would, you see, there would be quotes from her. So finally, I just, I, you know, I was not gonna give up. So I went to the New York Public, uh, City Public Library and they have uh, a library chat line. And so I went on the chat line and uh, I got a hold of this librarian, her name was Nora and I'll never forget she was not going to give up. She was going to find this article. It took her a half hour. She went from World Cat to, I forget the name of several other um, uh, databases. And she finally found it. She came, she came back and she typed in and she said she found it. And I thought, yay, you know, I'm going to get it. And, and she said, uh, so I went back and I said, where is it? And she came back to me and she said, at the Royal... Uh, Library of Scotland. And so I thought, oh no, you know, how am I ever going to get it from there? And she goes, no, no. She said, I've got the, I have their, uh, their email address. And so she gave me the email address and I emailed them thinking, oh, I'm never going to hear back from them. But in 10 minutes, I heard back, they had the article and they sent it to me. I just gave them my credit card. I didn't even ask them how much it was. And I think it cost me like, it was either eight or $10. And I, and I got the article. So, and it did, it gave me, gave me quotes, gave me uh, more information about what had happened. And um, it was just, uh, it was just a fun, uh, uh, like a treasure hunt to me. So my next uh, story is about a couple of uh, ladies. Um, they were uh, um, madams. And they were from up in Port Clinton, Ohio, up near the lake, of course. And um, this one, her name was Rose Pasco. She originally, she lived in, uh, in Cleveland 
and she married a guy named Pasco, James Pasco, I believe it was, if I remember correctly. And she moved up to Port Clinton and set up a house of ill repute. So it was very close to Camp uh, Perry, where the, uh, uh, you know, where the army um, uh, had exercises. So, you know, of course, uh, she had, uh, she had a lot of clients from there. And um, she had a lot of brushes with the law too, and brushes with the, uh, with the army. And her houses were always, you know, raided and everything. And what always kind of surprised me, and, and I've written about uh, madams before, but the police always arrested the women. They never arrested the men. They always arrested the women. And so she got arrested, you know, a couple times, but um, she'd, uh, she, they, and they close her down and she moved down the street and open up again. And the newspaper at the time was kind of uh, interesting. The newspaper called her Dago Rose. <clears throat> and I, I later learned from her, um, her granddaughter that she did not like that name. She didn't like to be called a Dago. Most, most Italians don't like that, uh, don't like that very much. So Rosie had a son named Michael, and he married uh, a lady named Lillian Lewandowski. And she was called, uh, although she was, I'm going to give you another picture of, there's, there's Rose again. This is 1947. You can see by the, um, uh, by the plate on the car there. Um, so Mary, uh, uh, Michael married um, uh, Ginger. Lewandowski, and she became uh, Ginger Pascal, and he and she ran different houses around. They were in the business, and uh, he and you know they would get shut down, and then they they'd open up again. Uh, well, Michael died in 1955, so Ginger took up with a man named Lewis Tailford, and Lewis had several aliases and I, I don't even remember all of them but the two of them went up to Michigan and they got in trouble in a nudist camp so <coughs> she was uh, she was just she was always always in the business they came home from there and in the 50s and 60s and up into the 70s Ginger ran a place called the round the clock uh, let me show you a picture of there's Ginger. Um, she's kind of a hard looking babe. Um, she went, she ran this place called the round the clock and that's it. I don't know why they have the sound, the, the sign, uh, Fraser's up, up there, but, uh, but that was it. And if you notice toward the kind of the center, I don't know whether you can see right there, there's a, uh, that was a clock. And it would always tell whether it was open. Now the downstairs was a restaurant, and it apparently had quite good food. And the upstairs was the brothel, and the open sign was to let men know that the brothel was open. So she and it was it was such a popular place; it made tons of money, um, and it. <clears throat> it was popular with men who were coming back from Vietnam. It was popular with businessmen from Ohio and Michigan, Indiana, because it was close to, you know, to those other states. Um, Lillian or Ginger paid taxi companies uh, to bring men there. And the taxis would drop men off and they would wait for them. And uh, the the brothel would pay the uh, the taxi companies. Um, it was also popular with truckers. And it's funny, but a guy that I went to high school with, um, he read the book, he got the book and he read it. And he told me that he used to, on his, uh, on his uh, runs through uh, the area uh, that he used to stop and eat there. And I said, yeah, Tom, I bet that's all you did was just eat there, you know, but, um, but he said, he said, yeah, he said the food was, you know, was really good. So there is a story. Lillian got two children, a boy and a girl. And 
they were not her. I mean, they were not her. She did not give, give birth to them. But the so this one story goes is that Rose, Rosie, her ex-mother-in-law, her uh, mother of her first husband, uh, bought these two kids for her. Another story was that uh, one of the prostitutes in the upstairs was, was their mother. Uh, still a third story was that uh, uh, one of the women that kind of had, whose name was Nancy, <clears throat> excuse me, um, ran, uh, uh, that ra ran the brothel. It was, it, you know, was, was their kids. Um, Nancy Ma Maxwell was her name. So, and I, you know, I didn't know all I, you know, I could just, uh, in the book, I could just say, you know, what the stories that I had heard. After the book was published, <clears throat> uh, it came out, I can't remember when it came out, but in September, uh, right after it came out, I got an email from a man who emailed me the whole story. And he said that his mother was a uh, cook at the um, uh, at the clock, and that she was this boy and this uh, girl's mother, true mother. And apparently, she had I can't remember how many kids she had, but they were by different fathers, uh, maybe like three different fathers, and she uh, would go to jail from time to time. And so she just could not take care of, uh, take care of her children. And he said, yes, that, uh, that either Rosie or Ginger had bought the, uh, the boy and girl. And I thought, what, you know, wow, what a story, what a sad story, you know? Well, in the early seventies, uh, Ginger left the clock uh, in the hands of, uh, and I love this name, Holy Joe D'Angelo, and this Nancy Maxwell, and they kept they kept it running. Now, why she left? Uh, there are two different uh, uh, two different ideas as to why she left. Um, the IRS was after her. Um, she uh, the the FBI, uh, AT and alcohol tobacco and firearms um, and uh, U.S. Marshals, they were all after her for income tax evasion. And uh, then another story is they were after her uh, because the children were not, you know, were not really hers. Um, she went to, uh, uh, she went to Arizona. Uh, for, before she got to Arizona, she went up to, um, uh, Las Vegas, and she met this guy named Belts, and uh, married him. And then they moved to uh, Arizona. So I have all this information, and it's you know, and it, to me, it's a great story. But I didn't have any of these pictures, and so I had written a blog about uh, about these two women, and I got. Um, I got emails back that were really nasty, you know, saying that I had no right to, to, uh, to write about Rosie and what did I know? And one woman said that I, you know, uh, why didn't I do some research? And so I wrote back to her and I said, well, since you seem to know so much, why don't you tell me what you know? And she wrote back to me and said, do your own research. So I don't know, you know, part of research is, is talking to people, you know. Um, so I, as I said, I had written this blog, uh, another blog, uh, by a, uh, uh, Toledo, uh, newsman who was retired, uh, I found, and it was quite interesting. It was mostly about Ginger or Lillian Lewandowski. And I had read about that and I used some of his information in my blog, well, I had a friend uh, who was a um, 
he just loved history and everything. And he texted me one day and he said, have you been on the newsman's blog lately? And I said, no. You know, he said, go on it because uh, Ginger's son has been on that blog. So I went on and I saw his, uh, uh, his message, his post on the blog. And so I knew then what his Facebook page was. So I went on the Facebook page and uh, he was a very nice looking man. Uh, the picture, he had a cowboy hat on and uh, was his wife was with him and they had uh, one of those real tiny horses, those small horses. And I could see in the background that it was out west somewhere and I, I figured it was probably Arizona. So I tried looking for him and I, I found a phone number and it was disconnected. And so I just sat here and I thought, okay, I need help. Well, I have a friend named uh, Rob Sperna who uh, uh, wrote uh, House of Horrors about um, uh, Anthony Soul, you know, from Cleveland. And uh, so I called him, it was a sun, uh, Sunday night. I called him and I told him what I was looking for. And he was at his desk and he was on his computer and I was in my desk and I was on my computer. And so he goes on the uh, Facebook page. And the first thing he says to me, he says, okay, I'm all set. And he looks at the, at the page and he goes, man, is she hot? And I said, you know, no, Rob, I don't care about her. I'm trying to find him. So he kept, he's mumbling under his breath and he comes back to me and he said, well, he said, I went on the, uh, uh, I looked up to see if there were any associations that had to do with these small horses. And uh, he said, I found a picture of her with a horse. And he said, her last name is, uh, uh, is not Tailford. And uh, the, boy, the son's name was Michael Tailford. And, but that was not her last name. So once we had her name, then I went to the recorder's office uh, in, um, uh, in uh, Phoenix and I found her and I got the address. And the address also had that there was a, a plumbing company there. So I went to the uh, state, um, uh, the secretary of state in Arizona and I found the plumbing company and I found the phone number. So then, and this is a Sunday night. And so I, cause I, I'm not going to call on a Sunday night. So I thought, well, all right, I'll call on Monday. And I thought I'll call Monday evening. And then I thought, I get thinking, what am I going to say to this guy? You know, am I going to, you know, pick up, he's going to pick up the phone. I'm going to say, you know, tell him who I am. And I am I understand, you know, your mom was a hooker and I'd like to talk about that. So, but I just, you know, I thought I got to do it. I got to call him, you know, so I, I dialed the number and he picked up, he had a very nice voice. And I said, uh, my name is, I said, uh, Mike, I said, my name is Jane Ann and that's all I got. And he said, I know who you are. And he said, he had read my uh, blog and he said, he said, I really liked it. He said, uh, he said, you really treated them, you know, fairly. And uh, <clears throat> So we wound up for talking, uh, talking for three hours that night and a couple of hours uh, another night. He sent me all the pictures that you see and more pictures that are in the book and more pictures that not, didn't make it in the book. He told me all kinds of stories that just, uh, he said, growing up, uh, you know, with your mother as a madam, he said, was just, uh, you know, just crazy. Um, <clears throat> so... Uh, and of course, I, I put all the um, I put all the uh, the stories in the book. Well, not all of them, but uh, a lot of the stories in the book. And um, it was just to, you know, it was, again, it was a great uh, uh, a great experience. <clears throat> so I'm going to go to the uh, to the last one I'm going to talk about tonight. And uh, this guy's name was Tilby Smith. Uh, that we're going up to Ashtabula now in <clears throat> May 1930, right about uh, this time uh, in, in May. And like I say, this is, uh, this is Tilby Smith. He was 26 years old. And um, Tilby, poor Tilby, he just came up short 
on the short end of a stick when it came to brains. Uh, he was in the seventh grade and he was 70, 17 years old. He finally dropped out. One of the teachers said that uh, during a, a spelling test, uh, she gave 50 words and he was only able to spell four words. And he was just kind of a failure at, at everything. He tried to start businesses and, and they all they all failed. And um, the newspapers called him uh, uh, slack jawed, dour looking. Well, yeah, he is kind of dour looking, I guess. And weak chinned and um, yeah, other, you know, uh, descriptive uh, things. This picture is, a, what they called a death card. And it came from the um, Ohio State Penitentiary and the uh, Ohio Connection, that's the Ohio Historical Society has all these death cards now because they got all the information uh, when the Ohio State Penitentiary closed. Um, and these cards, these are, these are portraits of men and women who were executed and they hung on the hallway going into the death chamber. And that's what these people would see as they were going to the electric chair. It was kind of, uh, kind of gruesome, I think, but that shows you what he looked like. Okay, now this is not in, in, the, news, uh, not in the book because uh, it's their newspaper uh, pictures and they were not good enough uh, to, to go in the book. But this uh, was uh, Maud, or I'm sorry, Jean Maud Lowther. And she was at the time, she was 22. And she was just, um, just a heavily damaged uh, young girl. Uh, she was from West Virginia. Uh, at the age of 15, she got pregnant by her 22 year old cousin. Uh, her dad just ran her life. <clears throat> her dad and the doctor who delivered the baby uh, made her marry the 22-year-old cousin. Well, of course, it didn't work out very well, and so they got divorced. She tried. Uh, she wanted to go to school. She had a couple of uh, jobs that she wanted to do, and her father would always stop her. He he. He just uh, didn't want her to do anything. And finally, uh, she married a man named Al uh, Alva, A-L-V-A, I think that's how you pronounce it, Lowther, who was 20 years older than she was. And her dad um, was okay with this because he figured that um, she would, uh, uh, she'd be taken care of. She and the, and, and the baby boy would be taken care of. Well, Alva took them up to Ashtabula and uh, they, they were estranged by the time that um, Jean met Tilby. And Jean and Tilby met uh, in the movie theater. And I guess Tilby, uh, he had a dump truck and apparently he thought he had a business. And he was telling his, uh, his wife, who is uh, this lady right here down in the corner, that was his wife, Clara. He would tell Clara that he was going to work every day, but instead what he was doing is he was meeting uh, Jean at the movie theater. And once in a while, I guess they would meet out in a park someplace in, in his truck. And so they were in love and uh, they wanted to get, they wanted to be together. They wanted to, to, to get married, I guess, but Al, what were they gonna do about Clara? So they hatched this plot that Jean was going to kill Clara. And how they were going to do it was the, uh, well, let me back up for a minute. Uh, Tilby on, uh, uh, was May 29th actually, uh, put his wife, Clara, and their two little kids um, in the dump truck. Uh, one was uh, one boy was sitting in the center uh, between his parents, and the other was a baby was uh, sitting on Clara's lap, and 
they were going to uh, May 29th, they were going to drive down to Clara's families to uh, uh, have a M Memorial Day uh, picnic celebration. And it was a it was a particular it was kind of a cold rainy day, and um, so they started down um, Saybrook Center Road, which was a uh, just a, a a lonely a lonely road, and uh, they were he was going real slow in this truck, and he knew where Jean uh, was going to be. And so he slowed down and Jean came out, she had the gun and she stopped the truck and she told Tilby to go around to the back of the truck and he did so. And then he, she went around to the passenger side and she shot Clara point blank. Uh, the baby slid off from her lap and the, the little kid that was sitting in the middle just bawled and cried and everything. And then Tilby told her to get out, to, you know, to, to go home, to go wherever. So she did. So Tilby uh, pulled his wife's body out of the truck and he laid her there in the mud. I, I don't know what he was thinking, but of course he wasn't thinking very clearly anyway. And he ran back to a gas station that his brother owned and uh, <clears throat> they called the police. And the police came out and um, started talking to him and uh, they started uh, realizing that, um, you know what, things just didn't add up. And he told them a story that there was a car pulled across the road and there were a couple of men in this car and they got out and they had a gun and uh, they were trying to rob Tilby and Clara, but they didn't have any money to give them. And uh, so um, the guy, um, you know, this fictitious guy pulled the trigger and <clears throat> Tilby ducked and the the bullet went past him and hit Clara. Of course, uh, the coroner knew that the bullet had come from a different direction. So, you know, so nothing added up. So this guy uh, was Howard Nazer and he's the, uh, he was the prosecutor and he was a very dramatic man. Uh, he was um, uh, just, I, I guess he didn't, you know, he didn't lose. He was just uh, something else. And you'd have to read about him in the book. But anyhow, um, he was, <clears throat> Tilby went on trial first. And uh, he pulled off one of his most dramatic uh, um, uh, things and this guy that's uh that's carrie uh, sheldon and he this is dunlevy and uh they were the they were the attorneys for uh, tilby smith or yeah tilby <clears throat> so let me see i think i've got yeah okay so there's uh there's sheldon and um you know they tried to they tried to say that Tilby was, you know, that he just did not have the brain power and um, that he was so low, low IQ, but it really didn't work. Uh, this is Howard Nazer again. Uh, it, it really didn't work with the, uh, with the jury. <clears throat> they, the jury uh, found him guilty and he was, uh, he was sentenced to, uh, to the electric chair and he died November the 20th. Uh, 1931. Um, so then uh, Nazer is going to put uh, uh, Jean Maud Lowther on trial and he wants to get the death penalty for her as well. Now there happened to be uh, like a lunch counter that was uh, close to the courthouse where all the attorneys would go uh, during lunch hour, and they would all sit together and they'd talk over their uh, their cases and stuff. Well, <clears throat> Clarence Darrow uh, happened to be one of the attorneys uh, up there. You know, he was from uh, uh, Kinsman, Ohio. And so Nazer was talking 
uh, to Darrow about this case. And Darrow said, you don't want to ask for the death penalty for a woman. He said, because you'll never, you'll, you'll never get a guilty if you ask for the, uh, for the, um, uh, for the death penalty. So he went back and he just, uh, he asked for a stiff, a stiff sentence. Um, she did 22 years. Um, she got out of jail. She got married. Um, and I think she had a couple kids and a couple more kids and, uh, she died in 1993. Uh, I got this picture after, again, uh, <clears throat> this was Nazar's granddaughter sent me this picture. And, uh, I just had to share it because I thought, oh my goodness, how handsome this guy was. So, a lot of this information came from, of course, I started at the Ashtabula Library. I uh, got a lot of information out of the newspapers, the old newspapers. And uh, then one of the librarians up there that I, I have become friends with over the years, uh, she told me about um, a judge, a uh, county judge up there that um, uh, was a historian. And she gave me the phone number. So I called and... Um, she uh, she didn't answer, but her her bailiff answered, and her bailiff said, "Oh no," she said, "It's not the judge that's the that's the historian; it's her husband, uh, and his name's Richard Dana, and he's an attorney too, and um, he uh, uh, he's also a professor at Kent State University." So I uh, and and they gave me the the number to get a hold of him. So I got a hold of him. He got me all these pictures. Uh, uh, they were from scrapbooks and things from the Sheldon family and the Nazer family. Some of them from the Denlevy family. Um, and um, that's uh, that's how I got all the information uh, from there. So that's kind of the end of uh, the stories I'm going to tell you about this book. Um, I just wanted to mention that this is the book that's out now that just came out last month. Um, and there's stories about, uh, there's a story in there about uh, Dillinger. Uh, this is one of uh, um, Carpus's friends. And this, of course, is um, um, Pretty Boy Floyd. This is another one of Carpus's friends. Um, so there's, uh, you know, bank holdups and there's a, a, a jewelry um, uh, a jewelry thief in there, and um, so that's that's pretty much that's pretty much it. And so you know, I'd like to hear what to, what folks have to say. We have any any questions or anything? Vicky. You want to unmute? <laughs> Does anyone um, have any questions for Jane well, or any comments that they would like to make? Okay, I see a question down here. Oh, she just says it's Denise Allen. She says, thank you for this. Um, and from Christy says, very interesting. I'll look forward to reading the book. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm sure you got it. There in the library, you probably have them all. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. And, so let's go visit your local branch and you can um, put them on hold. They're all checked out. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Liz Keene says, so cool. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, while we're waiting, I will tell you that I have a... Um, um, a web page. Uh, it's just simply my name, janeantrazillo.com. Um, and I also have a, um, a blog, which I mentioned during the, uh, during the presentation. And it's called darkheartedwomen.wordpress.com. Uh, but if you just plug in darkhearted women, um, you'll find it. I got um, to it um, through your um, web, web page. Yes, yeah. If you go on my web my web page, uh, you can you can get it. Okay, Louise, you're unmuted. Yeah, I don't know how. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I was just curious. How long have you been interested in wicked women? And have you always done this? 
I have, well, I've been writing since you know, 1974, I think. Ooh, okay. Um, a long time. Um, I got into, I have another Wicked Women book. It's a Wicked Women of Northeast Ohio. And um, I wrote that after I, after I retired um, from, uh, I was teaching at the time I retired and I was, uh, I was watching my grandchildren and during nap time, I, I would take my laptop and I would, uh, uh, you know, noodle around on the, on the computer. And I, I, I wanted to do a, a, a project. I just, I hadn't done anything in quite a while. And I, I wanted to do something, but I, I wanted to do something history because that's what I was, history and crime, that's what I was interested in. So I happened to find the history press. And I looked around and sure enough, they did history and they did crime. And I thought, baby, this is for me. But they were a traditional publisher and I didn't know whether uh, they would be interested. I had done two books for Arcadia. And um, so anyhow, I, I uh, thought, well, okay, I, I, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm gonna write up a query. I'm gonna think of something and I'm gonna write up a query, you know. Well, I didn't do it right away. And the funny thing was, was an acquisitions editor emailed me and, but he has, he was from Ravenna and he had, he knew about my Hudson book. And so he asked me if I would like to do a Hudson book for the history press. And I said, well, I didn't think that the Arcadia would like me, you know, to, to do that. Um, so I said, but you know, I told him that I had been on the website and that I would like to do something for them. And he said, well, why don't you throw, why don't you uh, pitch me three or four ideas? So I thought, oh my goodness, I don't have three or four ideas, you know, but I thought I can't let this go more than 15 minutes. So I wrote down, uh, I sent him pioneer women of the Western Reserve. Uh, there was an old time counterfeiter that used to live in the Valley and I had written about him extensively. Um, Akron Police Department, uh, because they had quite a history. And then just the last thing, I live in, Sh in a place called Shady Hollow. And I just, I just said, shady ladies. And I had no idea what, you know, I just thought, you know, he had said three or four. And I said, I thought, well, I, I better put four in there. And he came back to me like five minutes later. And he said, I like the idea of shady ladies, but let's make it wicked women. And so he asked me to, uh, um, to do up a, a proposal and I did the proposal and that's how I got started on it. <laughs> so, and then it did so well. And that's why I did, uh, uh, I keep, you know, I keep files all the time. I've got files here on my desk of, uh, unsolved stuff and, uh, uh, women for my, my, uh, website for my, I'm sorry, for my, uh, uh, for my blog. And I, I've got more women that I can do for another wicked women book. So. Uh, well, I hate to cut us off, but it, we're at seven o'clock and the oh. library is going to close. Um, I want to thank each and every one of you for coming. And I really enjoyed the talk and I hope you all did. We've got plenty of books available. If you are interested, just stop in your local branch and ask for them. And Jane, as always, it's a pleasure. Oh, it's been a pleasure for, for me. And by. thank you for everybody, uh, you know, everybody that came to listen. We will see you all soon and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you so much.